five. If I die sitting in my car because I'm a middle-aged man and I have a heart attack, I've died with my car. But I haven't died because of my car, have I? Four. I am not going to become a cash cow for Pfizer. I will not. Three. Brexit is not an event to be to be mourned by the international community. Two. I think Penny Mordaunt could be a, a dark horse or a flicky Palomino pony. <laughs> Welcome once again to Planet Normal, the Telegraph podcast with Alison Pearson. Hello. And me, Liam Halligan. Over a quarter of Tory MPs openly defied the Prime Minister this week, as more than 100 government backbenchers opposed key parts of Boris Johnson's Plan B for dealing with Covid infections this winter. The biggest rebellion since the 2019 general election saw countless Tories reject the reintroduction of Covid certificates for nightclubs and large events in England. The measures went through on the back of Labour support. Already embroiled in various sleaze rows relating to his Downing Street flat and attempts to rewrite rules on standards in public life, the Tories face a tricky Shropshire by-election today, Thursday, as this podcast is released. Photos of various alleged Downing Street and Whitehall parties last Christmas as the rest of us were locked down have done little to lift festive spirits, Alison. And as public tolerance towards and patience with anti-Covid restrictions wanes, big chunks of the Tories' core votes are furious about renewed clampdown measures when the link between Omicron and fatalities is still far from clear. A week is a long time in politics, Harold Wilson once said, co-pilot. And what a week this has been for Boris Johnson. Yes, and never mind having newborn baby daughter to get up to at three o'clock in the morning. You know what I reckon, Halligan? I reckon Carrie's one of those women who's cracking the whip. She's probably saying, don't give me any of that rubbish about running the country. Go and burp the baby. So no wonder he looks... Didn't he look terrible when he was giving that announcement? It reminded me of how much Tony Blair aged, but that was after 10 years in office, almost rather than just a couple of years. Yeah, I know. And, I, you know, I was thinking about the anniversary and, oh, how elated we all were and relieved that it wasn't Corbyn. And now two years down the line, it's like a mirage. Uh, before we get stuck in, let's hear a bit of a cheer, co-pilot, for Carlisle Football Club, Hooray! which is restricting its crowd capacity to 9,999 so that it <laughs> sneaks sneaks under the, the 10,000 limit for the wretched COVID passes. So I hope we're going to see a lot more of that kind of ingenuity and rebellion. I think a lot of this, the vote, we can talk about it in great detail, Liam, but I was thinking it's linked to all the parties and the disgust in the country about the parties. And I thought it was less mutiny on the bounty than mutiny on the volivon. What do you think? <laughs> <laughs> I do think there is a combination of factors that cause so many backbenchers to rebel, as well as the restrictions themselves, which many conservatives feel that their constituents feel are inherently anti-liberal. But on top of that, of course, these parties, and I don't even think we even need to say alleged now, because Whitehall's clearly investigating a number of events have riled the public. It's not just trivial. It's not just Westminster Beltway stuff. This concern that the public has about the rule makers flouting the rules last Christmas, it has, to use a media phrase, cut through. It is impacting public opinion. We wait to see what happens when voters choose a candidate in North Shropshire in the by-election. That's happening Thursday, the day Planet Normal is released. So we can't say too much about it for legal reasons, but it's already clear that the Tories are involved in expectations management, saying that they could lose because at the very least their 25,000 seat majority is going to be severely cut back. Yeah, number 10 will certainly be praying for a good result. I looked it up, Halligan, and North Shropshire is one of only six constituencies created before 1900 to consistently vote 
for the same party, having done so, voted Tory in every election since its creation in 1832. So it is going to be a pretty critical result for them. I mean, I think, you know, coming back to that vote, as far as I can gather, it did come as a big shock to ministers. They were hoping the rebellion could be kept to around 60. And I think the scale of it reminded everybody of those, you know, remember those dreadful, meaningful votes when the power and authority were drained away from Theresa May's premiership. So Boris is definitely in a very difficult position because he did win Tuesday night's vote, but only thanks to Labour, which leaves him, doesn't it, in a really awkward position. Because if he wants to introduce yet more restrictions, and I understand Professor Witty and the dreaded sage doom mongers are probably already pushing us to be sort of locked under the stairs for Christmas, he will have to rely on Keir Starmer, which of course gives Starmer lots of chances for mockery and mischief, doesn't it? It does. If a government has to rely on the opposition to get their business through, it's not a good look. And my concern now, Alison, and it's a concern shared by many of those Conservative backbenchers who rebelled, who you laud in your latest column in the, the Telegraph, and we'll put the link to that article in the show notes to this episode. My concern is that we're seeing lockdown by stealth. We had Nicola Sturgeon this week saying, oh, I'm not cancelling Christmas. On the other hand, <laughs> They're putting the frighteners on the public. They're limiting the number of households in Scotland. I'd be amazed. I'm sorry, it gives me no pleasure to say this, if Boris Johnson didn't tighten his restrictions in England in response to Nicola Sturgeon. They always seem to end up in a Dutch auction of who can be the most virtuous. But I think among a lot of the public, it looks like a Dutch auction of who can be the most reckless and overreacting yeah, to I agree. this. We still don't know if Omicron actually kills people to any degree. And it's not good enough for government ministers and their aligned scientists to say, oh, these aren't very draconian restrictions. Because what's happening is we're already seeing an enormous hit to business, an enormous hit to families changing their plans before Christmas, companies cancelling their Christmas parties and all the rest of it. And people can scoff, but the point here is, are we going to get into a situation, Alison, where every time there's a new variant, we shut down the economy just in case? That would be madness because there are always new variants because that's how viruses work. And my big concern here now is that the teaching unions are getting geared up to really dig their heels in. The medical unions are getting geared up. Are schools going to reopen after the Christmas holidays? Who knows? Yeah, I, I don't know if you saw, it did make me laugh that Professor Tim Spector of King's College London, founder of the Zoe COVID app, solemnly announced that the symptoms of Omicron are headache, sore throat and a runny nose. What does that remind you of, Halligan? <laughs> it reminds me of the night nurse advert, <laughs> Vic Sinex nasal spray. Oh, mum, I can't go to school with a blocked up nose. Of course you can, Malcolm. <laughs> But many listeners will be nodding from the waist because they too can remember Vic Sinex nasal spray adverts as they can Night Nurse and Beecham's Powders and Terry's All Gold and <laughs> Mellow Birds and Spam Fritters and all the stuff we used to survive on in the 70s. Oh, we had it tough back then. We did. We did. <laughs> I had to make do with a space hopper for Christmas. <laughs> Actually, I quite like a space opera for Christmas. I'm really quite concerned about this. What the hell is going on? So we were both quite keen, weren't we, when Sajid Javid replaced Hancock as health secretary. We were talking about the cautious but irreversible roadmap. Lifting restrictions would only be done if the absolute positive proof that the NHS was at a threat of being overwhelmed. And that Sajid Javid has gone from that irreversible roadmap to vaccine passport for children aged 12 to 15. And I'm just puzzled, you know, because about a week ago, Dominic Raab was on the Today programme saying Plan B wouldn't be required because of the high vaccine rollout, which was putting the UK in a fundamentally different position compared to the beginning of the pandemic. I remember feeling we're looking good now. You know, I felt very calm. I felt we we're going to have a completely OK Christmas. Many listeners will remember that deadening misery. I remember feeling almost exactly this time last year when I knew my mum wasn't coming for Christmas. My best friend was supposed to be coming. He had to cook her Christmas dinner and leave it on the drive on a tray. I mean, 
the, these incidents seem surreal, but it was very, very upsetting. And now what's going on? There was an unseemly eagerness with which the Prime Minister seized on the one death with Omicron. What does that mean, with Omicron? Just crazy, isn't it? Absolutely mm. crazy. Look, if I die sitting in my car because I'm a middle-aged man and I have a heart attack, I've died with my car. But I haven't died because of my car, have I? No. I mean, it's just mad. And the way the Prime Minister, as you say, linked a death with Omicron to death from Omicron, this is what's going to happen in the days and weeks ahead. People in hospital are going to get Omicron because it's very transmissible, which is what happens when viruses evolve. But they'll die in hospital from lots of things. But people will put Omicron on the death certificate and then the mainstream media will say, look at all these Omicron deaths. People are now dying. How can you be so heartless? And yet I would say to call these restrictions as we have them now, non-cost or non-draconian, that's completely mad. It's not non-cost and non-draconian if people won't meet with their aged parents over Christmas because their parents are scared and they may not have another Christmas together. These are really, really important things. For months, I've resisted the sort of conspiracy theorists saying, oh, it's got nothing to do with health. But you know what I'm feeling now, really, is it's all to do with the vulnerability or shall we be even ruder, the, the crapness of the NHS, Liam, you know, because what it's about, I think what they're doing is they know, basically, if a few million people get this cold with the scratchy sore throat and the back pain, a percentage of them who are older and vulnerable will get seriously ill. We know that will happen. That happens with flu. That happens with other respiratory viruses. And there's a tiny room for manoeuvre in the NHS because the NHS has had 21 months to improve capacity. We've had 21 months to buy up therapeutic drugs that you can give to people in their own homes. Three days later, they're better. We haven't done that, Liam. So what the politicians yet again can't stand is the prospect of the hospitals collapsing because that will reflect very, very badly on them. So basically, the blame has to be put on the unvaccinated or increasingly not just on the unvaccinated, but on people like me who are weighing up whether to have a booster, which booster to have as I've had COVID and I've double jabbed. And I've said this, Liam, on Twitter, I am not going to become a cash cow for Pfizer. I will not. You know, I will take whatever medical procedure that I deem to be necessary for me, good for my health. I think I have a robust immune system. And what we are literally seeing is the Prime Minister in a broadcast of the nation admitting that certain medical procedures and operations will be cancelled or postponed because they are going to spend billions vaccinating teenagers for a virus from which they won't even suffer. It's a total waste of money. Don't even get me started on the vaccine passports, which won't work because everybody who's vaccinated and everybody who's unvaccinated can also get COVID. So what we're looking at is absolute nonsense. But we are having this fear ramped up and they seem to want every adult in the country to have the booster. And I'm asking you, Halligan, what will it be in the spring? I am getting texts from my GP calling me again and again for my booster. They're not sending me reminders of a cervical smear test or a breast cancer scan. Which you're far more likely to die of by a huge multiple. Huge multiple. With all respect, Alison. Not that I want any harm to come to you, <laughs> no, of No, darling. Well, I know you're going to be dying in your car and I'm going to be keeling over from... Dying with car, not off car. <laughs> Yes. Do we want a little bit of George before we I think go we on? need a little bit of George to keep us sane in these crazy times. Yeah, all right. So let me just say, George is our senior source within NHS England, full access to the internal data. We don't disclose his or her identity, but we're confident of the authenticity of George's statistics, which is why we report them. We can't independently verify them because George tells us about them by definition before they're published, if they're published at all. 
Yeah, so again, it's quite an encouraging picture, despite what you hear on the six o'clock news, folks. COVID inpatients, there are 6,386 people with COVID in hospitals in NHS England. COVID admissions on Monday were 258 people. And those are people actually ill with the virus, Liam, going into the hospital unwell with COVID. But the inpatients diagnosed with COVID after admission on that day were 426. And that's people with COVID, not of COVID. COVID, all right. So this is the sleight of hand that we're constantly seeing. And there are 318 people were discharged having got better from COVID. And George is saying in terms of admissions, not higher or climbing more steeply than they were earlier in the autumn. In fact, by late October, there were over a thousand more COVID patients in hospital than there are now. And there were around 300 more hospitalizations every day. So says George, I just don't understand why now it's such a problem when many more people are double vaccinated and boosted. George says the NHS is busy. There's no getting away from that fact. But that can no longer be pinned on COVID. The most recent bed occupancy stats showed that 94% of all general and acute hospital beds in England were occupied, which is quite high and doesn't leave much room for manoeuvre. That comes back, Liam, to what we were talking about earlier. The government knows there's not much room for manoeuvre, hence all this desperation to keep people out of hospital. And George is saying that, you know, previous occupancy at this time of year, 2018, 90.2%, 2019, 92%, 2020 was down to 83.1%, which was at the height of the pandemic. But I think that just goes to show listeners that the NHS doesn't have enough capacity generally built into the system to deal with any kind of emergency. But George says the COVID burden compared to this time last year, is considerably lighter. Currently, only 5% of beds are occupied by COVID, compared to 12% this time last year. So less than half the number of COVID inpatients, which is actually reducing the pressure. And this is also very interesting. The other striking difference is the number of non-COVID patients is 84,000 compared with 67,000 this time last year. So it's no longer COVID that is causing the NHS to be under this any kind of exceptional pressure. George continues, where we are currently is where we have been for the last four months. So we should be in the mindset that this may be the level at which we will have to operate for the foreseeable future. It's the backdrop against which all hospitals have been asked to submit their operating plans for the remainder of the financial year. So the current level should not be a surprise to anyone and preparations should have been made to deal with that. And finally, this is very interesting from George. On balance, you simply cannot look at the current pressure on the NHS and conclude that it warranted an escalation of restrictions by the government and SAGE within such a short space of time. I would go so far as to say that I can't imagine the call to do something came from NHS England. I haven't heard the same level of anxiety about the general situation as I was hearing this time last year. And everyone is very aware of the desperate need to maintain, recover and catch up services and are all too well aware now of the horrible impact of any more restrictions on our ability to do that. So what we've seen, just to sum up George, Liam, for listeners this week, basically by introducing more restrictions, we will then lead to a backlog in the system, which is going to end up killing more people, but they're going to be saving people from the Omicron variant, which maybe isn't killing any more people. Are we, are we, are we going mad, Halligan? Are we, have I summed that up okay? I think you have. <laughs> and I, But the, the danger, I think, Alison, is that ministers don't want to see the evidence. They've decided to take us down a path and they will go down that path to the exclusion of even common sense arguments, even clear arguments. Why? Tell me why. Why? We've just heard from George... 
COVID in the hospitals isn't a problem. The problem is thousands and thousands of people who are sicker than they might have been because they've been kept out of the hospitals by COVID. How many more times are we going to do this incredibly destructive thing? You ask up why, Alison, and this is why I think, because politics is all about covering your backside first and foremost mm. and leadership fifth, sixth and seventh is way <laughs> down the pecking order. And if a public sector scientist hands a minister a bit of paper that says you have to do this and if you don't do this, then all these bad things are going to happen, then the minister, the prime minister, the health secretary, they pretty much have to do it because if the outcome that they've been warned about does then happen by chance that document is a smoking gun and their career is over. And so there's always a bias for just doing what the sage scientists say rather than mixing it with advice from an, other scientists. And there is a huge range of opinion across the scientific community. There's a huge range of opinion here in the UK, let alone between scientists in South Africa and SAGE, scientists in South Africa towards whom there has been a huge amount of snobbery shown, by the way. These people are world class, and we should remember that. And politicians will always take the low risk precautionary route for them and their careers. But in this case, increasingly, it looks like really bad news for the economy, for our mental health and for our freedom. Hello, I'm Brian Moore, the former England hooker. International rugby is back and so is my podcast, Brian Moore's Full Contact. Every Monday, we get the biggest and best names from the world of rugby to dive into every rook, more and TMO decision. Get the inside track ahead of the next Six Nations and hear the likes of England coach Eddie Jones and the breakthrough star Freddie Stewart. Search for Brian Moore's Full Contact wherever you're listening to this. Now, we don't ordinarily interview ministers here on Planet Normal, but we thought we'd make an exception for Penny Mordaunt. The country's first ever female defence secretary, the Portsmouth North MP ran the Ministry of Defence in 2019, towards the end of Theresa May's government. Known for her sharp debating skills in the Commons Chamber, Mordaunt made a splash a few years ago when she appeared in a reality TV diving competition, donating her appearance fee to charity. Now Minister of State for Trade, Mordaunt beamed into Planet Normal from Atlanta, Georgia. She's in the US touring various states, drumming up support for a UK-US FTA, or Free Trade Agreement. I spoke to our latest stirway about trade and Brexit, and also about the latest high drama in the House of Commons. But I started by asking Penny Mordaunt how important she thought a free trade agreement is between Britain and America. Well, we are doing exceptionally well, and we have these huge and deep trading relationships and cross-investment interests as well. But I think we can do more. And a super deal with America would, would be fantastic. It would generate growth. It would remove barriers for businesses. It would enable smart people to, to work on the same problems that we're, we're all facing. But I think there's some more gains that we can have as well, because when we talk about trade, understandably, we talk about those individual trade agreements. But there is a broader policy framework that we should also be focused on, reforming the WTO, removing trade distortions wherever we find them, enabling competition and I think if we joined forces on that agenda, and if the US had this at the heart of their national security, their international development, as well as their domestic agenda, we would do some incredible things, I think. So that that's what I'm just putting out the possibilities in my visit and hoping that we will get a, a good response to that. Now, the US are famously tough negotiators, particularly when it comes to trade, not least because the individual states, as you are now demonstrating have a say in that negotiation through their representatives in Washington. How are you finding it, Penny? In my experience, you're a pretty persuasive person, pretty good at negotiating, but it is tough, isn't it? Well, to be honest, Liam, I haven't had to do much persuading. Um, the response we've had at state level has been incredible. And it's 
It's come from every side of the political divide, from every sector, and it's very, very positive. People want to have obstacles removed from them doing more business with us. We've spoken to a lot of companies who are relocating and setting up hubs in the in the UK. Before coming out here, I spoke to all our metro mayors at home and many other people across the UK. And there's just such eagerness to really build those relationships, not just at a, a UK, US, you know, federal level, but also between different parts of the UK and different states. And I, I haven't had to do a lot of heavy lifting here at all. What I think we need to do is to turn the volume up on those opportunities and the energy and the dynamism that is in places like Atlanta and make sure that uh, our capitals are really hearing that. And so could you put a time frame on it? Obviously, the EU's looking closely. If Britain was to secure a trade deal with the US, still the world's biggest economy, that would be a coup, wouldn't it? Not just for Britain, but also for you, for Liz Truss, the former trade secretary for Boris Johnson. So I think that it will be a great thing. I mean, I personally don't doubt that it will happen. I'd love it to happen sooner rather than later. But it is obviously a huge, I mean, it would be best in class trade deal. So that does take a bit of time, which is why we want to get motoring on it. But in the meantime, we shouldn't let that slow us down doing what we can currently at state level. So the sorts of things we've been discussing are some localized memorandums of understanding between states in the UK or states and different parts of the UK to remove existing barriers to trade and reduce costs for business. That we can crack on with now. And that's what I've been doing as I've been going around. Now, earlier this year, Penny, you published a book with the investor Chris Lewis called Greater Britain After the Storm. It was a very optimistic, uplifting vision of Britain post-Brexit and what we could do with our newfound freedoms having left the European Union. I think it's fair to say there's quite a lot of frustration on the Tory backbenches and maybe across the country as a whole, particularly among people who back Brexit, that we haven't yet been doing enough to take advantage of those freedoms. It may be because, you know, the government's been busy. We've had a pandemic. We only ended the transition period less than 12 months ago. Do you think it's fair, though, that we haven't yet really grasped the post-Brexit agenda in this country? So I think we are getting there. I mean, I think that there is a lot of work that needed to be done. And actually, in fairness, although we have had the pandemic, in every part of government, there has been work going on to look at our own statute book to look at the regulations that we have, the work most prominently that Lord Frost is doing to remove bureaucracy and to really liberalise, particularly in the areas that are potentially huge growth areas, AI, data, transport, medicine, all of those sorts of things. So there's a lot of work that's gone on behind the scenes, which is a bit dry and wouldn't expect people to necessarily be across all of that, although you are, Liam. But I also think that we need to do more to wake up those opportunities for other nations as well. And that is what I've been saying when I've been going around the United States, that we want people to recognize what a phenomenal opportunity a G7 nation leaving the regulatory orbit of the EU is to anyone that cares about the free trade agenda and that anyone that wants to, as the United States do, CPTPP does, the WTO does, wants to have its trade policy based on adequacy and equivalence and really enabling more people to trade together to enable our trade to fit better with other nations. That is a massive opportunity, not just for our own economies, but also for the world to lift people out of poverty, to strengthen our national security. Brexit is not an event to be to be mourned by the international community, nor is it an act of self-harm or, or an act that requires us to be punished in some way. It is a huge opportunity. And we need to start to encourage people to see it in that light. And once they do, I think they will start to think about the benefits to their own local economies, their own constituents. And that's what I'm here to to talk about. I think it's fair to say, I hope you don't think I'm 
ungallant penny that you're quite an experienced politician now yes you only entered the house in 2010 but you were defense secretary our first female defense secretary in fact reflecting not just your portsmouth constituency but your very close links to the royal navy reserve over many many years so you know your way around whitehall so why is it that people like me looking on, trying to understand what's happening across government. We look at a policy like free ports, which is a real centrepiece of what Britain could do post-Brexit. Tax-free or tax-advantageous zones, particularly around coastal communities, particularly in less prosperous parts of the country. And yet I talk to an awful lot of people in Parliament. I talk to people across the regions who basically feel the Treasury is trying to stymie free ports. Would you accept that we have a problem, that parts of our civil service are just not embracing this post-Brexit agenda? Well, you will know, Liam, having kindly mentioned my book, that uh, I am very keen that we modernise in Whitehall and a few other places as well. I, I think that we have got to get the architecture in Whitehall to work for the modern world. We move so quickly these days things change. It's very difficult to be situationally aware as a minister about what's going on, about what the opportunities are there out out in uh, every part of the world. And so unless we've got the systems in place to do that, it's very hard for us to to do our job and maximise that return. However, I have not been idle in this respect. And in the three months I've been in this post, I have redesigned the architecture of how we do trade across every government department. And starting in the new year, we will have a new interministerial trade group that will actually meet in number 10. And it will look at the policies that we need to be shaping across every part of government to to maximise this agenda. And we've also developed, again, very boring, very dull, but information products Uh, And businesses will understand how important this is so that we can be across the opportunities that are there in every part of the world. And we can be really, really clued up and informed about those opportunities and also our offer as the UK. And it's a very simple thing, but it's a really important thing to enable us as ministers to do our job better and also the civil service that supports us. So I'm hoping that will make a, a difference. But we have to do this across all sorts of other areas as well. But but do you recognise the sort of language that your colleague Michael Gove might use describing certain parts of Whitehall as the blob, averse to change, almost obstructionist sometimes? Well, our, our job as ministers is to shape the blob. It's to <laughs> motivate, encourage, give very clear objectives about what it is we're trying to achieve. If we don't have the information given to us or things aren't working in the right way, it's our job to change that. We are doing this job. We've stepped up to do this job and we should do the job and take responsibility for getting those results. And I spend a lot of time in every department that I've been in explaining to the team that is there to support us why we're doing something, why it's important, why I'm asking them to do things in a different way and to point to the good stuff that comes from it as it inevitably does. That's what we need to do. You can't flick a switch and things change overnight. It requires work. It requires culture change and it requires the structures that we have to be reformed and modernised. But that's our job and we should be getting on with it. You're currently away from Whitehall, of course, in the United States on ministerial duty, helping the UK to negotiate a free trade deal with the US. But you are an important figure in the House of Commons as well. What are your thoughts looking on at the UK on this vote that the government's about to face, on the fact that Nicola Sturgeon has just introduced new, more restrictive anti-COVID measures? So I think it is incredibly important that we think about what the public and what businesses will be thinking, feeling and going through at this moment. We have got to keep morale up and we have got to retain trust and confidence from the public in the decisions and the advice 
that we are giving. I very much believe that uh, if you're going to vote on some rules, don't undermine them in the meantime. I have very robust conversations within government about what I think should be happening. But we have to also explain to the public and give good evidence why we are asking that certain things happen. And we have to retain that trust and confidence. I would say that business has actually been really ahead of the curve on a lot of this. People haven't been asked to do particular things, but they've done them anyway. They have had their own policies on masks, for example. They've had their own policies on testing, on taking people's temperature when they uh, come into a restaurant or go to the theatre. Business is really responsible about doing this. uh, And the more we work hand in hand with business about what is actually going to work for them and the things that they think will make a real difference, I think the more successful our advice will be. Uh, And in every aspect of this that I've been asked to contribute, that's what I've tried to do. Talk to those umbrella organisations and businesses directly. Is there a danger the government's overreacting here? We don't even know the extent to which Omicron kills people. There's been one recorded death with Omicron, not necessarily of or because of Omicron. And you can't say that anti-COVID restrictions and mask wearing don't have a major impact on business, don't have a major impact on mental health, don't have a major impact on children's lives at school, for instance. So I think that we have to get a balance here. I am in favour of things that are a precautionary principle because I don't want lockdowns, I don't want restrictions on economic activity and on social activity, to be to be brutally frank, where I think there is huge reluctance in the House of Commons and across the country are things, that, you know, ideas that are not well evidenced and that are going to have severe impacts on people's well-being, uh, mental well-being included, and on economic activity. And I think that one of the reasons for that is that as well as this particular virus, people know that this is an issue. They know that this is, whether it's this or another bug that can crop up years hence, we have to adapt to live with that possibility. But we also have to realise we have to live with that possibility and that reality. We're at the point, Penny, though, where some of your colleagues on the back benches are saying that the reason the government's doing this is to distract from other bad headlines about other bad things going on in government. How have we reached that point? My personal view is that's not the case. I I don't think that uh, the scientists and healthcare professionals that you see at press conferences are the sort of people that would do that. I think the advice that they're giving is, is very genuine. And it's our job to explain that to the public and to also try and retain their trust and confidence. I think we've just got to focus on the big picture and focus on what we should be dealing with. We have a lot of things to do in addition to ensuring that we get through this this winter well and to deal with the COVID situation. There are serious things going on all over the world, including on uh, Europe's eastern border, There's a huge job of work to be done on all sorts of things, including what I'm doing here in in the US. That's what the public want us to focus on. And I think sometimes it's very refreshing to get out of Westminster and be reminded what matters to people and to make sure that we're working on those things. Penny, a lot of your colleagues on the back benches will rebel when they vote in the House of Commons. Some of your colleagues in government will rebel. Do you blame them? No, I don't. I think it's a a great system that we have that anything that we do has to be scrutinised by Parliament. People take their jobs in Parliament very seriously. I think they're very genuine as to how these approach these issues. No, I mean, I have, Liam, occasionally rebelled myself on some issues. It's our job in those moments to do that. Where I think we need to be careful on this issue is that we need to retain trust and confidence. So, I hope that when ministers are at the dispatch box today, they're going to give good, solid, evidenced reasons why these asks are necessary, why they will make a difference. And they have to also provide, I think, some hope and reassurance to the public uh, about what the future will look like. 
I'm all for precautionary principles, but we have to get on with this. This is part of our lives now in, in the world we live in, and we need to bear that in mind as well. What would you think if schools didn't reopen? A lot of parents are really worried about that, not just because they need to go to work, but for the mental health of their children. Well, I think one of the greatest tragedies in this, particularly in the last uh, two years, has been the huge amount that our young people and children have have missed out on. I think this is uh, this is really serious. I think you know Rob Halfon, my colleague, has done some great work in this area and on what we need to do to ensure that people can catch up as much as they can in every part of the UK and in every one of our schools and colleges. Uh, I think that is the the worst possible outcome from anything that might happen in the future. And I think we need to do everything we can to avoid that and the immense harm that accompanies it. Penny Morton, thanks a lot for joining us on Planet Normal. Well, co-pilot, I think she rates you, doesn't she? <laughs> it's not this interview. Why don't you start again? <laughs> <laughs> no, you're blushing. If Penny Morden saw Halligan on a space hopper, she'd soon change her opinion. Look, I think she is fantastic. Planet Normal listeners, if they want to Google Penny Morden versus Angela Rayner at the dispatch box, she absolutely destroys Gobby Rayner. And I think she's a real force to be reckoned with. She's a proper person, Penny Liam. She went to a comprehensive school in Portsmouth. I think she lost her mum, sadly, to cancer when she was just 15. In the sixth form, she earned money by being a magician's assistant, basically being sawn in half and chopped to bits by the president of the Magic Circle. And she's also a Royal Navy reservist. She was So she was a really able defence secretary and Do you remember the shock when she lost that job? And I was speaking to quite a senior conservative and I said, what the hell happened with sacking Penny Mordaunt, who was an eminently able defence secretary? And he said Boris didn't want her in in that position because she was too capable and Carrie didn't want her in that position because she was too pretty. What do you think, Halligan? I do think she suffers a little from tall poppy syndrome because she is very, very able And I do think she's kind of on the cusp of breaking through into sort of more national recognition. Her time at Defence as Secretary of State was pretty short because, of course, there was a snap election. But no one doubts her capabilities in that area and the huge knowledge she has and and the respect that she's held in by the armed services. Why was she sacked? Why did she lose that job? It seemed very odd to me. Didn't it seem odd to you? I think... You know, some people in politics shine too brightly and leaders get nervous of them and want to put a veil over them. And I think Penny Morden suffers from that. And yet here she is now. She's treading carefully. That was a very measured interview. She was clearly speaking as a minister of the crown, which she is. I spoke to her just before that crunch set of votes in the Commons on Tuesday evening. I think she was pretty pleased not to be in the House of Commons having to take part in that vote because she was, of course, on official business in the United States. But I do think she's a kind of planet normal person, if you know what I mean, and regular listeners will. I know she certainly listens to the podcast, as do many people in government, as a kind of secret pleasure. It was interesting, though, even though you're right, she was being diplomatic and courteous as befits her position. But she did talk about a huge reluctance to go along with ideas that are not well evidenced. I appreciated the fact that she was very firm about the damage to schools. So I think that she was signalling, wasn't she? Some sort of tacit criticisms, I think, of of what's going on. And I also think now with Boris and a fix, there is growing talk of a potential leadership contest and and you know they're all talking about the usual suspects you know the sort of Rishi Sunak Priti Patel but I think Penny Mordaunt could be a dark horse or a flicky Palomino pony Now on to our emails. We've had a raging torrent this week as listeners vented their spleen on all things Omicron, Plan B and partying at number 10 while the British people were told to live by very different rules. If you feel like joining in this conversation, please email planetnormal at telegraph. .co.uk. First, we're going to start, Liam, with an email from a Planet Normal legend, 
listeners will remember that Robert Styler, a Conservative Party donor and lifelong voter, wrote to us expressing his frustration at not at being unable to visit his wife and teenage sweetheart Josephine in her care home. Liam, I and The Telegraph, we did our a bit of campaigning and, and Robert and Josephine were able to have one final meal together before last Christmas and then Josie very sadly died. Liam, this is when Robert was obviously responding to the video or showing Allegra Stratton doing a mock press conference about allegations of parties. Robert says, you will not be surprised to hear from me once more. I have resisted an earlier message merely to give me time to compose myself. The picture of Allegra Stratton says it all and paints the picture of the incompetent and untrustworthy occupants of number 10 Downing Street. I sit here in the beautiful home I inherited from Josephine, still grieving like many thousands of others who were not allowed to cradle their loved ones into the unknown. With my imaginary size 15 boots on, ready and willing to boot out the occupants of 10 Downing Street, I will not be resigning my membership of the Conservative Party because I want to use my vote to help to remove our current Prime Minister from office. He has become a liability, untrustworthy, presiding over an administration whose judgment must be called into question. Boris may wish to think of himself modelled on Winston Churchill, but he would have been better served if he had taken on the mantle of Margaret Thatcher. There is little else to say now because words fail me. With best wishes to you all on Planet Normal. Have a lovely Christmas, Robert. And, and you too, dear Robert. This one's from Joseph. Hello, co-pilots. I just listened to your episode Parties, Plan B and Betrayal and I thought it might be worth sharing a bit of my own experience. I'm a builder, 38 years old. I kept calling my GP, no face-to-face appointments in sight, in September 2020 due to abdominal pain and was fobbed off with some acid suppressants with the doctor even joking, it won't be the big C. After pointlessly taking those acid suppressants, very quickly losing six kilograms in weight and having unbearable pain, my wife, and I'll never stop thanking her for this, forced me to go to A&E. There I was quite quickly diagnosed with bowel cancer. When she later met our GP in person, she read him the Riot Act regarding his comments to me earlier as only a young mum of four can. I was operated on quickly and had to undergo chemotherapy, which finished in April 2021. On top of that, we all had COVID while I was recovering from my operation, from which we all recovered after a few days. Frankly, the 10 days house arrest was the most difficult part. So it's been quite a difficult year, but from what I hear on your programme, I was one of the lucky ones. The care I received veered from excellent, as we've often found, to pretty damn awful, and the follow-up since I finished my therapy have consisted of one phone call. That's it. I should be having various scans, but have not received any news regarding this except a vague idea that it should be sometime next year, though no letter has reached me about this as of yet. There are many other things I could share, as I'm sure all of us could, about these difficult times. It seems to me the collateral damage from these pointless lockdowns and restrictions is of a magnitude that's now becoming apparent to all of us, whether on the health of our bodies, the health of our minds, or most importantly, the health of our souls. The lockdowns need to end, full stop. I find it refreshing indeed to listen to your podcast and can only hope that if we all keep banging the drum of common sense, then common sense may prevail, even if sometimes I truly fear it will not. Kind regards and happy Christmas, Joseph. Well, we wish you well, Joseph, and please keep in touch about any follow-up treatments. You know, this is what we're dealing with, Liam, people falling through the cracks. Here's another very moving email from Dr. Julia. That's not her real name. Julia says, firstly, thank you for the calm and sane podcast every week. I listen to it while walking the dog and look forward to hearing your common sense dissection of the madness that is the world we are living in. I actually cried whilst listening to Professor Gordon Wishart's calm description of the unfolding cancer crisis, which struck both a personal and a professional chord. I am a breast cancer survivor. I was diagnosed whilst pregnant at 29 weeks with my now eight-year-old daughter. I went to the GP, was examined, but told not to worry as this wasn't cancer. However, I was referred under the two-week wait. I was seen in the one-stop shop breast clinic, the most efficient service I've been part of as a patient, seen by the breast advanced nurse practitioner who gave me false reassurance. The radiographer performed the biopsy and then I was seen again by the surgeon within a week of a diagnosis of cancer. 
Devastated is not the word, but I did receive my treatment early. I am still here today because of early treatment, and I'm thankful to the wonderful team at Guy's and St. Thomas's who supported me through treatment, which was complicated and restricted by my pregnancy. It was the most frightening time of my life. To think there are women, young women out there, who are unable to secure a face-to-face appointment with their GP or are falsely reassured or over the phone who do not come forward because they don't wish to pressurise our sacred NHS or have just not accessed screening because it was halted and who possibly are walking around with undiagnosed cancer is terrifying. This was highly predictable. The NHS has let down the people by prioritising COVID, using COVID as an excuse to be virtual and as an excuse to cover up a failing, under-resourced, understaffed organisation. The lack of response to the cancer report by Professor Wishart's committee is abhorrent and I question the integrity of the Chief Medical Officer in a lack of response to this. And I agree that the NHS requires major reform and not more money. Professionally, I'm a palliative medicine consultant. I see patients in the last year of life. This year, I have seen more and more patients diagnosed with stage four cancers who are only fit enough for palliative chemotherapy or too sick to receive any treatment at all except palliative care. Unfortunately, the majority have been too scared to come forward or have not been adequately assessed by primary care. I believe many more are dying at home, excess Home deaths are 30% above the five-year average. The thought that there are 50,000 people walking around undiagnosed is terrifying. That was me. Young mums, grannies, sisters, colleagues, all with treatable disease if detected early. I do not understand the lack of awareness of excess home deaths and the cancer crisis shown by Professor Twitty, well said, and Valance. This is the true public health crisis, along with all the other well-documented harms of lockdown. COVID cases at my trust have been static for months, as have deaths. I fully agree with you that non-COVID deaths will far outnumber COVID deaths. It is a scandal. And honestly, I question if I can work within this broken, short-sighted system much longer. With a palliative medicine consultant shortage of approximately 80 across the country, with many of us retiring in the next five years, The impending number of patients needing our service will again not receive the care they need because the resources will not be there. We only die once. We need to get it right. The most awful thing for me is knowing that many of these people who I will see in the coming months to years would have survived if it were not for lockdown. Liam and Alison, keep up the amazing work. You too, Julia. What... What an amazing email. From a senior person inside our health service. Absolutely devastating. Wow. Here's one from John. Dear Alison and Liam, Boris Johnson has morphed into chicken licking or allowed himself <laughs> to be moulded into chicken licking by the doom mongers of Sage and other assorted lockdown lovers. Should you read my email out on the Planet Normal podcast? Well, here we are. By the way, that's a good name for a common sense political party. Yay. I leave it to you to remind listeners of the story of chicken licking, as I hear it is no longer used in schools due to diversity, gender and triggering issues. (laughs) Apologies, that last statement was a lie, or to use the correct modern terminology, I misspoke. My six-year-old grandson knows the story of chicken licking and totally grasps the stupidity of panicking without reason. In truth, panicking in any situation is a waste of time. It solves nothing, though not to panic would be showing the old steady British character that our political masters sadly lack. So why does our government do it? Why does it trot out graphs of hospitalizations in South Africa whilst ignoring World Health Organization data showing zero recorded deaths attributed to the Omicron variant? Why does it frighten folk when vaccinations have proven effective in countering every variant and the word from Pfizer is that their vaccine is effective against Omicron? The simple answer is the tail is wagging the dog and any views on economic fallout, effect on family life, jobs and other NHS responsibilities other than COVID falls on deaf ears. All for Professor Shinetra Gupta and her clear, measured, intelligent, informed reasoning. Boris and the government appear enthralled to the power of the darkly named nudge unit's ability to control the population with their project fear. 
I would remind them how well Project Fear worked for the government of David Cameron. It's time for Boris to get back on the straight and narrow of small government, low taxation, support for enterprise, and dare I say it, reaping the benefits of Brexit. If the Prime Minister fails to do that, I believe he will soon join the ranks of David Cameron and Theresa May as ultimately disappointing Tory Prime Ministers. I say that as a severely disappointed, lifelong Conservative voter. I'd like to end at this festive time by mentioning that in the woke version of Chicken Lickin', which I found <laughs> on YouTube, Chicken Lickin' and his, her, their friends didn't get eaten by the wily wolf. They got to the king who was a turkey. Made me wonder if Boris is feeling a bit like a turkey right now. Keep up the planet normal weekly dose of sanity. To paraphrase the film Jaws, you're going to need a bigger rocket to accommodate your growing band of sanity seekers when you fly us each week to planet normal. This is from Ian. I've never heard you two so angry and with very good reason. No apology necessary, Alison. You nailed it as you almost always do. I'm sure your visceral response to plan BS <laughs> is exactly how most planet normal people feel. Now, I doff my cap to your superior knowledge of the Westminster bubble, but is the dead cat theory still a conspiracy theory if it's believed by one or more cabinet ministers, according to Fraser Nelson, the editor of The Spectator? And I'm really not buying that the acceleration of Plan B, with its masks, its vaccine passports, its working from home, the need for debate about mandatory vaccination is just down to the arrogance of the elites in the civil service, insisting that they know what's best for citizens of the country and go hang any of the unintended consequences. Even if it destroys more lives and livelihoods than this rather pathetic virus ever could, that just doesn't add up for me. This is not a dead cat diverting strategy, then it is something far more sinister. I think what the Westminster elite have realised is that the golden goose that is COVID-19 is about to kick the bucket and whatever plans they still have in place on the back of COVID-19 need to be enacted and fast. But what do I know? Now, Alison, please unload that revolver and start working on saving the sanity of your planet normal people for another week. Best regards, Ian. And finally, this is from Helen, very brief. Try replacing Omicron with athlete's foot. Looking at global data, they seem on a seriousness par. A tsunami of athlete's foot? Seriously. <laughs> <laughs> and that's it for Planet Normal for another week. As we leave our sanctuary of sweet reason, our flying refuge of reasoned views, our rocket of right thinking. Email of the week, Alison, it's you. We're coming up for Christmas now. Look, let's give Dr. Julia a mug. Let's give Joseph a mug and wish him well in his recovery. We're feeling very munificent this week. So Julia and Joseph, you're definitely going to get mugs. If you enjoy Planet Normal, and we jolly well hope you do, do leave us a rating and a review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen. It really does help others to find us and it cheers both Halligan and I up when we're trying to deal with all the madness of this situation to see your lovely, lovely praise. And every Thursday morning, Telegraph subscribers can talk to me on the Telegraph website. Find the article labelled Planet Normal. This week it should have a picture of the lovely Penny Mordant. Leave a comment beneath it and I will reply to you between 11 and noon. It is you, our fantastic Telegraph readers and Planet Normal listeners who make this podcast. So do keep in touch. Indeed, do keep emailing us. I should say that Alison and I really enjoyed speaking to so many Telegraph readers at the recent Telegraph Christmas charity phone-in. Us and other colleagues, we raised the thick end of £100,000 for the four designated Telegraph charities. Thanks to so many of you who phoned in and talked to us, many Planet Normal listeners among you. We should also say that next week's Planet Normal, the 23rd of December, will be the last one of our year. It will be a Christmas special. Alison will have her sleigh bells on her <laughs> knee, giving them a little shake. I might even have some antlers on, if you can imagine that. We will be taking a break on the 30th of December from Planet Normal. But we'll be back again in the new year. And as we speed away from our beloved Planet Normal and the madness of Planet Earth comes back into view, thanks as ever to our producers, Isabel Bujard, Louisa Wells, Elliot Lampitt, and our editor, Theodora Leloudis. Stay safe and in touch with us and with each other. Until next week, it's goodbye from me. And Halligan may sing a carol to you next week. It's goodbye from both of us. <laughs>